In this video, we're going to talk about section 3.2, dealing with polynomial functions and their graphs. And in this section, we're going to talk about how to identify polynomial functions, recognize characteristics of graphs of polynomial functions, determine in behavior. Also, we we'll use factoring to find zeros of polynomial functions and identify zeros in their multiplicities. All right, so let's define first what a polynomial function is. And it's going to be this. It is the function defined by f of x equal to a sub n, x to the n, plus a sub n minus 1, x to the n minus 1, plus, and it goes on and on all the way down to plus a sub 2x squared plus a sub 1x plus a sub 0. We call this a polynomial function of degree n. And here we can identify two things. The number, which is a sub n, that's going to be the coefficient of the variable to the highest power. We call that the leading coefficient. And of course, degree is always going to be the highest exponent of that polynomial function. So if I had a polynomial function like this one, let's say I had f of x is equal to negative 49 x cubed plus 806 x squared plus 3,776 x plus 2,503. That's an example of a polynomial function, okay? And in that polynomial function, we can see that the highest exponent here is the three. That's considered to be the degree of that polynomial function. That's the highest exponent there. It's a third degree polynomial function. The negative 49, that's the coefficient of the variable to the highest power. That is considered to be the leading coefficient. Okay. All right. So to be familiar with uh, how to identify the leading coefficient and how to identify the degree of that of any polynomial function. All polynomial functions are considered to be smooth and continuous curves. So polynomial functions of degree two or higher have graphs that are smooth and continuous. What we mean by smooth is they're rounded curves with no sharp corners. And continuous means that there are no breaks, meaning I can draw the graph without lifting the pencil off the paper. Okay, so these two graphs that you see here are considered to be smooth and continuous curves. The two on the right are not graphs of polynomial functions. In this case, here you can see that there is a break in the graph. Okay, it goes up, then it's going to come down, and then it jumps all the way down here, and then goes back up. That's considered to be discontinuous. There's a break in the graph. Also, this graph here is not a polynomial function because you have sharp corners in that graph, okay? So do be familiar with what a polynomial function looks like when you're looking at a graph and what a polynomial function does not look like from a graph. All right, every polynomial function does have what they call the end behavior. So that's gonna be another definition we need to look at, the end behavior of a polynomial function is the behavior of a graph of a function to the far left or to the far right. So if you look at these two here, we can see on this first graph, this graph is falling to the left and rising to the right. That's the end behavior of the graph. And this one, 
rises to the left and rises to the right. That's the end behavior of that polynomial function. Now, let's say you didn't have a uh, graph in front of you to determine the end behavior, and you just had a polynomial function. In this case here, we can look at the leading term, which is a sub n x to the n, to determine the end behavior of any polynomial function. Okay. So on the next page, you're going to see what we call the leading coefficient test. That's what we're going to be using to determine the end behavior of the graph of any polynomial function. Let's say as x increases or decreases without bound, the graph of the polynomial function, which is this, where a sub n is not equal to zero, eventually rises or falls. And this is in particular. So here you're going to have two cases here where your n is going to be the highest exponent in that polynomial function. It's either going to be odd or even. That will be the first thing you do. Determine whether n is odd or even. Now if n is odd, that means 3, 5, 7, 9, and so on. You're going to determine these two cases. You're going to look at your leading coefficient next. So the leading coefficient, which is the coefficient of the variable to the highest power, is positive. That means this is your end behavior for n is odd and the leading coefficient, a sub n, is positive. That means the graph of f of x will fall to the left and rise to the right. Falls to the left, rise to the right. Or if the leading coefficient is negative with n being odd, then your n behavior is going to be this. The graph of f of x rises to the left and falls to the right. Now let's say your n, which is the highest exponent in that polynomial function, is even. That could be squared or to the fourth or to the sixth or to the eighth and so on. Let's say your leading coefficient a sub n is positive. This is your n behavior. The graph of f of x will rise to the left and rise to the right. Or if your leading coefficient is negative with n being even, then here's your n behavior. It falls to the left and to the right. Okay. Now, here's a hint that I've provided here. If you have an odd degree polynomial function, you're going to have a graph with opposite behavior at each end. So here, n was odd. And of course, you're going to have opposite behavior. With uh, your a sub n being positive, it's going to fall to the left and rise to the right. And then n, I mean, a sub n negative, rise to the left, falls to the right, for n being odd. Now, even degree polynomial functions have graphs with the same behavior at each end, okay? So in this case here, n being even, even on the left and the right, you're gonna have the same behavior. Also the same behavior here on the left and on the right. All right, let's look at some examples of this. Here we're going to apply that leading coefficient test to determine the end behavior of the graph of this function, f of x equal to negative 5x to the fourth plus 7x squared minus x plus 9. Okay, so here's what we need to identify first. I need to identify the n. I also need to identify a sub n. That n is the highest exponent in this polynomial function. Well, as you can see, the highest exponent there is 4. So n is going to be 4. And then a sub n, that's going to be the coefficient of the variable to the highest power. Well, the highest exponent is 4. Its leading coefficient will have to be 
negative five. So we need to look at n folks to determine whether it's uh, even or odd. Well, n is four, that's an even number. And a sub n is negative five. That's of course negative. So going back to this leading coefficient test, n is even and a sub n is negative. So this is our n behavior. The graph falls to the left and to the right. So we can say here that the graph of f of x falls to the left and to the right. Okay. Now I believe some textbooks use arrows here to show that it falls to the left and to the right. Okay, let's look at example two. Again, we're going to apply the leading coefficient test to determine the end behavior of the graph of f of x equal to x to the fourth minus four x squared. Well, we need to identify the n, and also we need to identify a sub n. The n is the highest exponent in that polynomial function. In this case, is four. The a sub n is the coefficient of the variable to the highest power. Well, the highest power is four. Its coefficient is that understood one. So a sub n, which is your leading coefficient, is going to be one. And then we look at n to determine whether it's even or odd. In this case, it is even. A sub n, which is one, that's positive. So that means if we look at our leading coefficient test, n is even, but the leading coefficient is positive. So this is our n behavior. The graph of f of x rises to the left and to the right. Okay, so we can say here that f of x, the graph of f of x rises to the left and to the right. And sometimes they use those arrows rising to the left and to the right. Okay, here's another example. Let's say we had this. We want to use the leading coefficient test to determine the end behavior of the graph of f of x equal to 2x cubed times the quantity x minus 1 times the quantity x plus 5. Now, one way of doing this problem would be to go ahead and multiply that polynomial out completely and then find out what uh, n is and what a sub n is going to be. So in this case, I'm going to bring down the 2x cube. And then I'm going to multiply x minus 1 times x plus 5 using the FOIL method. And that's this, the first term times the first term, x times x, that's x squared. The outer x times the plus 5 would be plus 5x. The inner minus 1 times x would be minus 1x. And then the last times the last minus 1 times the plus 5 would be minus 5. Now, if I combine like terms in the parentheses, I have f of x equal to 2x cubed times x squared. And then 5x minus 1x would be a plus 4x minus 5. Now I'm going to distribute the 2x cubed over the x squared plus 4x minus 5. So I'm going to have f of x equaling to 2x cubed times x squared. 
that's 2x to the fifth. And then 2x cubed times plus 4x would be a plus 8x to the fourth. And then 2x cubed times a minus 5, which would be minus 10x cubed. So this is my function, f of x equal to 2x to the fifth plus 8x to the fourth minus 10x cubed. And then the next step would be to go ahead and identify the n and the a sub n. Your n is the highest exponent in that polynomial function, which is in this case, 5. And then a sub n is the coefficient of the variable to the highest power. That's going to be 2. All right, next we'll determine what our n behavior is going to be. Well, n is 5. That's an odd number. A sub n is 2, which is a positive number. So going back to this leading coefficient test, our n was odd. A sub n was positive. So this is the n behavior. That means the graph of f of x falls to the left and rises to the right. So we can write this out as f of x. The graph of f of x falls to the left and rises to the right. Okay. Graph of f of x falls to the left and rises to the right. And sometimes they use the arrows too to show falls to the left rises to the right. Okay, take a look at example four. So here's a word problem that deals with uh, the leading coefficient test. The polynomial function f of x is equal to negative 0.27x cubed plus 9.2x squared minus 102.9x plus 400 models the ratio of students to computers in the U.S. public schools X years after 1980. Use the end behavior to determine whether the function could be an appropriate model for computers in the classroom well into the 21st century. And explain your answer. All right, so here's our function that we're looking at, f of x is equal to negative 0 0.27 x cubed plus 9.2 x squared minus 102.9 x plus 400. So in this case here, we're going to find the end behavior. We have to use that leading coefficient test. Okay. So let's identify what n is and a sub n is going to be. The n is the highest exponent in the polynomial function. That's going to be 3. Yeah, a sub n is the coefficient of the variable to the highest power. Well, if the highest power is 3 on the x, its leading coefficient will have to be negative 0 0.27. Okay. So now we look at our n to determine whether it's even or odd. n is 3, that's going to be odd. a sub n, negative 0.27, that will be negative. Well, that is negative. So going back to the leading coefficient test, n is odd. Our leading coefficient was negative, so this is the n behavior. If the graph of this function rises to the left, and falls to the right. So to say here that f of x falls to the left. I'm sorry. Rises to the left and falls to the right. f of x rises to the left and falls to the right. 
falls to the right. That's the end behavior of the graph of that function. Now, the question is, uh, we want to determine whether this function could be an appropriate model for computers in the classroom well into the first 21st century. Well, let's think about this. And I'm going to do this visually because I'm just going to draw the end behavior. And I really don't care what's happening in between. But if it's rising to the left, we're OK. But then it's falling to the right. If it's falling to the right, what's going to happen here is the values of f of x will end up being negative. And of course, you cannot have negative numbers, a negative amount of uh, computers. OK, that doesn't make sense here. So this function would not be an appropriate model for this situation. So we can just say here that this function would not be an appropriate model for this situation. Because at some point, when our x values get bigger, the values of f of x will end up being negative. And having negative computers would not make sense. All right, so that's how we apply the leading coefficient test to these problems. All right, next we'll talk about zeros of polynomial functions. The zeros of f are the values of x in which f of x is equal to zero. And these values are what we call roots or solutions of the polynomial equation f of x is equal to zero. And if you remember when we were doing quadratic equations where it was in general form and you have to do some factoring. In this case, we're going to be doing the same thing here with uh, higher degree polynomial functions in this section. So like in this example, let's say we got this, f of x equal to x cubed plus 2x squared minus 4x minus 8. And here I want to find all the zeros of that function. Okay. So let me write my equation out as x cubed plus 2x squared minus 4x minus eight. We're gonna set that equal to zero because we are finding out what values of x will equal to zero since we're finding the zeros of that function. Well, let's do some factoring on the left-hand side. Notice we got four terms. So that means we're gonna have to use what they call the grouping method. I'm going to group the first two terms and then I'm going to group the last two terms and find common factors here. So in this case here, x cubed plus 2x squared, I need a common factor here. Well, I know for one and two it just have to be one, but for the x cubed and the x squared, we use that common variable with the smallest exponent and it will have to be the x squared. So let's factor the x squared on the outside. And to get what's on the inside of the parentheses, I'm going to do x cubed divided by x squared. That's x plus 2x squared divided by x squared. That's going to be 2. So I have x times the quantity x plus 2. Now for minus 4x and a minus 8, in this case, I need a common factor that's in minus 4 and a minus 8. Well, for four and eight, that has to be four because you want the largest 
number that goes into four and eight, and it has to be four. This is negative, so I'm going to use a minus four. So I'm factoring out the minus four. So in this case here, if I do minus four X divided by minus four, that would be positive X. And then minus eight divided by minus four would be plus two. That's equal to zero. Now you can check this by using the distributive property. So if you do X squared times X plus two, that will give you the X cubed plus two X and then distribute the minus four of the X plus two, you should get this back minus four minus minus four X minus eight. Now you can see the common factor is X plus two here and here. So let's factor that X plus two. And the other factor for that will have to be these terms on the outside, X squared minus four. And then that's equal to zero. Now that X squared minus four is what we call the difference of two perfect squares. That can be factored as the sum of the and the difference of two terms, of the same two terms. So I'm going to bring down this x plus 2 and then factor x squared minus 4 as the sum and the difference of the same two terms. So here that x squared breaks up as x and x. For 4, what number times itself gives me 4? Has to be 2. And I did say sum and difference, so that means one has to be plus and the other one has to be minus. So factor completely, I got x plus two times x plus two times x minus two equal to zero. And then we're gonna set each binomial factor equal to zero. So this means x plus two equals zero, x plus two again equals zero, and then x minus two equals zero. And each equation we're gonna solve for x. So for the x plus two equal to zero, I subtract two, you're gonna get x equal to negative two. For the x plus two equals zero, again, x is equal to negative two. And for x minus two is equal to zero. If we add two to get x is equal to positive two. So here, the solution for that would be just negative two and two. And as you can see here, negative two and negative two occurs twice. We call that a double root. And the reason for that is that I get x equals negative two twice as the answer. So that right there is what we call a double root. Okay, and I do need to mention if you're not familiar with factoring, if your factoring skills are not up to where it needs to be, there are videos on YouTube that will help you with uh, factoring, okay? Because that x squared minus four is just like the sum and the difference of the same two terms, okay? Because you got differences of two squares, we can factor that out as the sum and the difference of the same two terms. Okay, here's another example. Here we're gonna find all zeros of f of x is equal to x to the fourth minus four x squared. Okay. And of course we set f of x equal to zero. And here f of x is x to the fourth minus four x squared. That's going to be equal to zero. So now we need to factor those two, uh, those two terms. Factor here. Well, notice that x to the x is in both of these terms. We take the one with the smallest exponent, which is of course x squared. So we need to factor x squared. And then if I do x to the fourth divided by x squared, that's gonna be x squared minus four x squared divided by x squared, that will be four. That's equal to zero. 
Now, again, just like that x squared minus four, that's the sum, that's the uh, difference of two perfect squares. I can factor that as the sum and the difference of two of the same two terms, which is of course, x plus two and x minus two, just like I did in that last example. And that's equal to zero. And now we're going to set each individual factor equal to zero. So this means x squared will be equal to zero. And then x plus two is equal to zero. x minus two equal to zero. And each equation we're going to solve for x. So for the x squared is equal to zero. Uh, the opposite of squaring will be to take the square root on both sides. So that means x has to be equal to zero. And then for the x plus two is equal to zero. If I subtract two, you'll get x equal negative two. And then for the x minus two is equal to zero. That means x is equal to two. So this is our solution for this polynomial function. Here we got zero, negative two, and two. And that x equals zero, from x squared is equal to zero, we call that a double root because that x squared equal to zero means, I'll do this off to the side, means this, x times x equal to zero. So that means x equals zero and x equals zero again. That's our double root. And if you look at your highest exponent, there is four. That means there has to be four solutions. And x equals zero is that double root. Because you have two x equals zeros, then negative two and two. That makes up the missing solution. Okay, last thing we'll look at in this video is this, multiplicities of zeros. We have double roots that I just got through talking about this also, something called multiplicities. And factoring the equation for the polynomial function f, if the same factor occurs x minus, if the same factor x minus r occurs k times, but not k plus one times, we call it we call r a, mul a multiplicity, well, zero in multiplicity, k, okay? If the same factor x, r, x minus r occurs k times, but not k plus one times, then r is a zero with multiplicity, k. And multiplicities have some relationship with x-intercepts because when you're finding the x-intercepts, you're finding actually the zeros or the value of x where this, uh, the graph crossed the x-axis. So here, if r is a zero of even multiplicity, then what's gonna happen here is the graph touches the x-axis and turns around at r or if r is a zero of odd multiplicity, of odd multiplicity, the graph cross the x-axis at r. So in this case here, if I was to do a graph to illustrate this, I'm gonna try to do this one to the right. Let's say r1 is a zero and R2 is a zero. And let's say R1 is a multiplicity, is a zero with even multiplicity. What's going to happen here with this graph is it's going to come down and touch the x axis at R1 and then it's going to turn. So let's say R2 is a zero with odd multiplicity. 
what's going to happen here is that graph is going to cross the x axis at R. Okay. So that's what we mean by the behavior of those uh, multiplicities at those zeros. So if we look at example seven, let's say I want to find the zeros of f of x equal to four times the quantity x minus three times x, minus, x plus six quantity cubed and give the multiplicities of each zero and then state whether the graph crosses the x-axis or touches the x-axis and turns around at each zero. Okay, so here's my function. F of x is equal to four times x minus three times x plus six. And that quantity is cubed. Okay. So of course I need to set f of x equal to zero. So that means f of x is that four times the quantity x minus three times the quantity x plus six cube is equal to zero. And notice that it is factored completely, okay? If it wasn't, then the first thing you'll have to do is factor that polynomial completely. That way you can set each factor equal to zero. And in this case, we're gonna set each factor equal to zero because it's already factored completely. So I'm gonna set four equal to zero, and then I'm gonna set x minus three equal to zero, and x plus six quantity cube equal to zero. Now that four is equal to zero is not true, so we can scratch that out, because four does not equal to zero. Now for the x minus three equal to zero, if we solve the x by adding three, that would mean x is equal to three. And then for the x plus six quantity cube equal to zero, well, the opposite of cubing something would be to take the cube root on both sides. That would mean the cube root of, cube root of x plus six quantity cube would be x plus six. That's equal to zero. And then to solve for x, we subtract six. That means x is equal to negative six. So those are the zeros of this function. Now we need to state their multiplicities. To state the multiplicities, all we look for is the exponent, where it came from, like x equal three. It came from the x minus three up here when we set x minus three equal to zero. That exponent for x minus three is the understood one. So x equals three has a multiplicity of one. And then for the x equal negative six, that came from the x plus six. Its exponent for x plus six is a three. So x equals negative six has a multiplicity of three. And now we're gonna use that to determine the behavior at those zeros here. Well, x equals three has a multiplicity of one. And this represents odd multiplicity. Odd multiplicity is gonna be one, three, five, seven, nine, and so on. Here we have an odd multiplicity because one is an odd number. So that means with odd multiplicity, we know what's happening with the graph. It's gonna cross the x-axis at r. So at x equals three, the graph of f of x crosses the x-axis. That's the behavior at x equals three of that graph. Now, what about x equal negative six, the other zero? At x equal negative six, 
well, x equals negative six has a multiplicity of three, which is of course odd multiplicity as well. So that means at x equals negative six, the graph of f of x will also cross the x-axis. Okay. All right. All right, and finally, this is the last example in this video. Dealing with multiplicities. Here we want to find the zeros of the function f of x equal to negative four times the quantity x plus one half squared times the quantity x minus five cubed and give the multiplicity of each zero. State whether the graph cross the x-axis or touch the x-axis and turns around at each zero. So I'm gonna go ahead and rewrite that function, which is of course f of x equal negative four times x plus one half squared times x minus five, and that's cubed. So what I'm gonna do here is set f of x equal to zero. So that means negative four times the quantity x plus a half squared times x minus five cubed, and that's equal to zero. And it's already factored completely. So in this case here, we're gonna set each factor equal to zero. So I'm gonna set negative four equal to zero. Then we'll set x plus one half quantity squared equal to zero. And then I'm gonna set x minus five quantity cubed equal to zero. Well, we know negative four is not equal to zero, so we can eliminate that altogether. That's a false statement. Now for the x plus a half quantity squared equal to zero, the opposite of squaring something would be to take the square root. Now, actually, I don't need the plus or minus here when you're doing the square root on both sides because zero is neither positive nor negative. Okay, so the square root of x plus a half, quantity squared is x plus a half and that's equal to zero. Subtract one half to get x by itself. That means x is equal to negative one half. And then for the x minus five quantity cubed is equal to zero. I'm gonna cube both sides because that's the opposite of cubing. So that means I have x minus five equal to zero. Add five to both sides, you'll get x is equal to five. So my zeros here are x equal negative one half and x is equal to five. So now let's find their multiplicities here. For the x equal negative one half, that came from this x plus one half here. The exponent for x plus a half is two. So x equals negative one half has a multiplicity of two. And then for x equal five, that came from x minus five. That exponent for x minus five was q, was the three. So that means x equals five has a multiplicity of three. Okay. All right, now we need to find out what the behavior is at each zero. Well, at x equals negative one half, let's start with that. Notice it has a multiplicity of two and it's an even multiplicity. So with even multiplicity, here's the behavior. The graph touches the x-axis and turns around at r. So at x equal negative one half, the graph of f of x touches the x-axis 
and turns around. Okay. And now for x equals five. It has a multiplicity of three, so that's an odd multiplicity. So that means at x equals five, the graph of f of x simply crosses the x-axis. Okay, so that does conclude this video on section 3.2 dealing with polynomials, poly polynomial functions and their graphs. Um, do feel free to email me if you have any questions about the homework in my math lab or any questions about the examples that were presented in this video.